All right, well, praise the Lord again, everyone. My name is Brother Ray McHugh Jr. And I will be uh, your teacher for tonight. And we will be discussing in our lesson, continuing in our lesson on moving to, on to perfection or the move on to perfection series. Uh, tonight we'll be picking up from obedience where we left off, amen? But before we do that, let's just look on a few things, our goals, objective and purpose. Uh, our goal is to inspire our saints to become diligent seekers of God's perfect will for their lives. Uh, our objectives is to faithfully develop disciples who will execute the word of God with precision and communicate truth rightly divided. Our purpose is that we want to provide curriculums and an environment in which the saints may acquire a deeper knowledge of God's holy word. And we desire to have disciples, to disciple and encourage the word of God in such a way that it will develop and nurture, here it is, mature behaviors acceptable for ministry. So the reason why we're going through these teachings, we really want to develop and nurture mature behaviors that is acceptable for the ministry. Amen? There's an harvest that is coming. Uh, you know, you can tell anyone you know that bread is in praise sanctuary ministry across all three churches. God has been speaking to our churches and therefore we know that our churches are going to grow because bread is in the house. Therefore means as individuals, we have to be prepared for the harvest, amen? So our focus scripture has been, uh, we've been focusing on Hebrews chapter six, one to two. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrines of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. We will also be looking on a little more closely when we get there. Matthew 5, 48, be ye therefore perfect even as your father, which is in heaven is perfect. Second Corinthians seven and verse one, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. All right. So these have been our focus scriptures for a while. We've been going through these um, teachings and uh, I advise you, if this is your first time to this series, please watch the videos from the previous classes so that you can be caught up to speed, right? As Brother Jermaine shared earlier, um, Brother Douglas, shared earlier, we know that Hebrews chapter six, perfection, the word perfection was speaking as it pertains to maturity and being complete, right? Completeness. And that what it is and what maturity is, or when we say completeness, this is the full development, the full development. I'm going to say that again. The full development of a Christian in knowledge, obedience, and 
beliefs, right? Understood as having every necessary or normal part or component or step. So we want to make sure that after this series is complete, that all our disciples have an understanding of how we are we become perfect in knowledge, right? And we heard shared from Sister McLean tonight that we really can't. The application of knowledge is what we know to be wisdom, right? And so if we have no knowledge, we can have no wisdom. You can't have wisdom without having knowledge, okay? So when we say to individuals um, that, uh, you know, you have no wisdom, okay? That can go two ways. Number one, they can have knowledge of a thing, but don't have the wisdom to apply the knowledge right, to whatever situation they're dealing with. So it is, it, it is possible for someone to have knowledge of something, but don't have the wisdom in what is the most suitable approach um, or way to utilize that knowledge. And then the next part of that is that they just might not have the knowledge of a thing. And so because they don't have the knowledge, they can't utilize any wisdom. Amen? Is that clear? Is that clear to everyone? Come on. Amen. 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 Talk to me. Amen. Amen. All right. And um, we are now dealing with obedience. And so let's run over to that. We understand that obedience deal with compliance with an order, request, or law, or submission to another's authority. This is from the Webster Dictionary, right? Uh, we understand that the word um, obedience is from the original word in the Hebrew, obey, which means, um, well, it's from the word obey, which in the Hebrew is the word Shama. And if you have been in church for any amount of time, you have heard that tongues before. I'm sure you have heard that tongues before Shama. Amen. Which means to hear, to listen, um, to hear or of or concerning, right? To pay attention to and to develop an interest in, okay? To give heed, that's what it means. So when we say to obey, what we're saying is you need to listen and listen keenly and then give heed to that which you have heard, okay? And uh, we thank um, Pastor Casey for the lesson last week. And so we will go on. This week, I want to focus on, I want to focus on a few things. And I know we have been dealing with obedience from the sense of we need to listen, we need to take heed, we need to do that which is instructed of us to do and we have spoken about how children are to obey their parents we have spoken about how wives are to be submitted to their to their own husbands and so having an understanding of this right uh, individuals are getting it that we need to be submitted and we cannot be submitted as Sister Fagan shared to God if we are not submitted to our leader, okay? But 
we are challenged at times. We are conflicted at times. Should we obey leaders that we know is outside of the will of God? And how do we deal with that? How do we submit to someone that we know they are not in the will of God? Well, let's jump into our, our, our lesson for tonight. And let's prove whether it is a right thing to do or not. All right, so reader number one, I did not select a reader number two. I'm so sorry. Um, Sister Dion, are you able to read tonight? Or Sister McLean? Minister Mary? Driving, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, Sister, Sister McLean, are you able to read tonight? I'm sorry, Minister, I'm about to leave the house. All right. I will be tweeting, but I'll be driving pretty soon. All right. Plus, Lord, I'll read. Amen. Sister Thank, you. Thank you, Sister Diana. All right, reader one, uh, first Samuel chapter two, verse 27 to the 36. Like I said, we have a, a few reading to do tonight, but we'll get through it. Uh, we're going to be looking on how Samuel, which who was a child, with, um, the first time we heard of Samuel was in the ending of 1 Samuel chapter uh, 1. We learned about his uh, conception, right? In chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, we see where his mother, Hannah, who was barren, brought him back to the temple so that he could serve, right? Because it was a promise that she had made to the Lord. Now, we're going to pick up in chapter 2 and verse 27, where we're going to see that God needed a man. God needed a man because there was a particular situation that was taking place in Israel, and God was fed up, right? Remember now, Samuel, when he's, when he's been taken to, back, um, to the house of God, to serve in the house of God, let's remember that Samuel had just been weaned from the breast. He was just getting weaned from the breast. And it is in this same chapter, we're seeing where God sends a word, right? Another thing we, we, we want to, we're going to see in this um, scripture is that many individuals have it that Samuel was the first prophet mentioned in scripture. We're going to see here that indeed there was a prophet before Samuel. Amen. Not to negate Samuel's um, role here, but I just wanted to point that out to especially our Bible scholars. You might come up on discussions with these um, questions. And I just want to put it out there that Samuel was not the first prophet. Amen. We'll, we'll see it here. So first Samuel chapter two and verse 24. 24. 27, sorry. Okay. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus said the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer up on my altars? my altar to burn incense to wear an ephod before me. And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation. 
and honors thy sons above me to make yourself fat with the chiefest of all the offering of Israel, my people. All right, so let's hold on there. So let's, let's explain a little of what is happening. The duty of the priest, Eli here is considered a high priest. The duty of the priest was to take the sacrifices that the members of the congregation would bring to them and to offer it unto God. Now, between the process of killing the sacrifice, purging the sacrifice, putting the sacrifice on the altar, which represents fire, what they were really doing was cooking the sacrifice, okay? So they're putting on the fire, what we would call maybe a grill today, and they would cook the sacrifice. Now, when they cook the sacrifice, the priest was supposed to take a portion for himself and his family, and then was supposed to return it to the members of the congregation. But what we see here was there was an assault on the people of God in that they were taking um, the, the sacrifice and the fat thereof, and they were keeping it to themselves. And primarily the individuals that were doing this were Eli's sons. In these days, when you are a priest, what we consider a high priest, your children automatically became priests, okay? This is why we know from Bible, whether Old Testament, New Testament, we see this in scriptures. God, does, God never ever just calls one individual to ministry. Most times when you see an individual that is in ministry, unless they're single, their family is also involved. We see that Old Testament, New Testament, God always calls the family. God is a family man. He's a, he's a unit, right? So here it is that the children were supposed to serve Israel. But instead of serving Israel the right way, they were making a mockery of the procedures that were outlined. And so this is what now God is dealing with. Okay, Bishop, you can continue. Amen. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord said, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thy heart. And the arm of thy father's house. And there shall not be an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation in all the wealth which God shall give Israel and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever and the man of thine whom I shall cut off from mine altar shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart and all the increase of thy house shall die in the floor of their age. All right, hold on, be... hold on, Bishop. So, so here now, we see God had made a promise with the Levites, okay, the Levitical tribe. And he had told them that as long as the tabernacle exists, you were never supposed to work. A Levite was never supposed to work. His duty was supposed to serve the kingdom. He was never to have an inheritance. And in these days, an inheritance meant that you had land, okay? This is why 
even to this day between Palestine and Israel, they're fighting over what? Land, okay? So that's what having an inheritance meant, okay? You had land. Now, they were never supposed to have any land because it was the other tribes that duty to take care of them. But here it is now, God is revoking that promise that he had given to them. God is taking um, that benefit plan away because they dishonored God and also dishonored his people. This is why as leaders, we have to be very careful how we treat the people of God. We see this with Moses, how that Moses uh, was given an instruction to strike the rock once, but before, because of the people, he was upset with the people, he struck the rock twice and ended up dishonoring God, right? God does not take kind to that. And you know, in leadership, we have to be accountable. We can never say that it was because of the people why we did this. And it was be it's because of the people why we did that. We must do what God has instructed us to do. And if God says that we're supposed to honor his people, we're supposed to treat them with respect, we're supposed to take care of his house, Hear me, leaders, that is the expectation. Let's do that. Let's not do otherwise. And then point fingers and say, it was because of this individual why I didn't do what I'm supposed to do. Because God will judge us. Here we see now um, in verse 33, where God is saying that, and the man of thine whom I shall not cut or from mine altar shall be shall be to consume thine eyes. We saw that where Eli's eyes became dim, right? Consume thy eyes and to grieve thine heart. We saw that Eli, when you read the scriptures, heart was so broken, he fell off the chair and he died. And we see, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. The increase of his house would have been his sons. They died in the flower of their age, in the youthfulness of their um, life on the battlefield. Just because individuals were dishonoring the command of God. Leaders, I want to say to us today that some of the times why hell breaks loose in our house is not because of anybody else but ourselves. It's we that's in the wrong and have dishonored God, especially when dealing with his people. And so what God does is allow for havoc to take place in our homes. You wonder why your children is going wayward. You wonder why your, your business, I, 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 when, you, when you look on this, you saw that even Eli, fi, Eli's finances were cut off. You wonder why things, your financing, finances are just drying up. We just need to go back to the root of the problem. We need to consider how are we dealing with individuals when we are in the position. My God, my time is gone. Amen? All right. Continue, Pastor. Amen. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons, on Ophni and Phineas. In one day they shall die both of them. Now I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart, 
and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before man anointed forever. Amen. All right, we'll stop there because of the interest of time. Now, notice this. Two things taking place here. The Lord is going to raise up a priest. So we know now that Samuel was a prophet or is a prophet, however we want to say it. But here now we see that not only did God give him the ministry of being a prophet, but he also gave him the ministry of being a priest. So Samuel was the first to walk in both the anointing of a priest and a prophet. All right. All right. First Samuel, second reader, first Samuel chapter three and 11. Quickly. And the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do a new thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. Continue. To verse 21. In that day, That's I will perform to Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. All right. So watch this now, church. Sorry. Watch this now. Here is it that Eli, sorry, that Samuel is a little boy. He's a little boy. This is the first time that he's hearing, he's a young man. And this is the first time that he's hearing the voice of God. He does not know the voice of God. So Eli has to tell him how to answer when he hears the Lord calling him, right? Watch what God does. God tells Samuel at a young age that I'm done with Eli. We see that in verse 12 and verse 13. Read verse 13 now. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. Amen. So Eli would not correct his sons. But we see in this same chapter two here that Eli did speak to his sons. He did. He did say to them, what is this evil that you're doing? But you know what? There's a difference between saying, what is this evil that you're doing? And as the high priest saying, you are going to be sat down until you learn Christ. Well, of course, Christ was not manifested at that time, but until you learn God, right? Remove them from the position because he was the high priest, okay? Again, this is a nugget for leadership. Okay? If you know that someone is a bad apple in ministry, we cannot keep them there. Someone say, but, but we can correct them. Well, there's a difference here. Okay? We can correct those that want to be corrected and is submitted to, be, to um, take correction from their leader. But if it's someone that is defiant, disobedient, and we know is making a mockery of the things of God, which the Bible calls an iniquity. It's our duty to remove them because when God comes to judge, he's not judging them. Only. Only. He's going to judge the leader. Amen? Amen? I know Amen. this is tough tonight, but y'all just stay with me. Okay? All right. Time is far spent. When you get a chance, read the rest of, of, of this scripture. Um, but I want us to go down to verse, um, Sister Diana, uh, go down to verse uh, 21. No, not 21. Okay. Go to verse 19. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and didn't and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Amen. Amen. Samuel grew, right? And every word that he spoke, not one of it 
fell to the ground. Now, in this same scripture, we saw where Samuel told Eli the, the vision or what God had instructed him. But notice this with Samuel. Even though Samuel knew that God was through with Eli, you never see in scripture where Samuel lifted up his voice against Eli. You never saw in scripture where Samuel said, um, you never see where Samuel said, you know what? God is through with you. I don't have to listen to you anymore. Bye-bye. No. As long as Eli was alive, Samuel served in the temple of God. Samuel served under Eli and did not disrespect Eli, even though God told him that you were next in charge. How many of us are humble enough today to know that God has chosen us to be the next in charge and will never lift up our hands against our bishop or our pastors just because we know that God has chosen us. Because watch, the, watch this. When the anointing of God is on us, God still expects of us to be submitted to a man. The man who he has chosen. And have in the position until he takes that man out. We see this in 1 Samuel chapter 16, Bishop, uh, verses 14 to 23. Let's see if we can get through this real quick. David, we're going to look on the relationship with David being submitted to King Saul. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an ark, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servant, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a young, a son of Jesse, the better man that is cunning in plain, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent, sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Go to verse 22, please. Send me David, thy son, which is with sheep, and Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him and he loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse saying, let David I pray thee stand before me for he had found favor in my sight. The verse one. All right, that's good. Amen. So that's good. Thank you, Bishop. So, and the ending of this story, please write the scriptures down, is that David, whenever he played, the evil spirit will, 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 would go away. Now, David was a man, not only cunning, in, well, when you say cunning here, he's speaking about being skillful in music, right? He wasn't just skillful in music. David was also uh, a worshiper. He, from a, a tender age, had known the, the Lord, had had experiences with the Lord, right? 
But even though David knew that he was anointed, knew that the Lord was with him, right? David at no point lifted up his voice against the king and said, well, it's I who have the anointing to play the music. So I'm not going to serve you, even though I know that the spirit of God has been lifted from you. You did not see that. David humbled himself and served the king, even though he was outside of the will of God. The anointing had left him. Hold on to your seats. It's about to get a little bit more challenging. First Samuel chapter 24 and verse 1 to 10. And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistine, that was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of wild goats. And he came to the sheep coat by, way, by the way, where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remain in the sides of the cave. Okay, hold on. Hold on, Bishop. So when it says Saul went in to cover his feet, well, it's saying that Saul was tired. And so he went to sleep in the cave. But while he went into the cave to sleep, David and his men were in the cave. Go on, Bishop. The men of David said unto him, Behold the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirts of Saul robe privately. And it came to pass afterwards that David... Oh, on, arched... Give me one second here. Do you see what's happening here, church? Do you see what's happening here? We have to be careful of the voice that we listen to. Because sometimes someone might be privy to the anointing that's on our life. Someone might be privy to what God has promised us and then use it as a means to justify doing evil, doing wrong. And we have to know as anointed individuals when to stop the voices of those who think that they're doing something so dearly. They think that they're helping us out in our time of distress. We have to judge, we have to discern for ourselves whether these voices are of God or if it's just that the enemy, Satan, has taken over their lips. We see this with Job when his wife said, curse God and die. Job said, you speak like a foolish woman. We see this with Peter when Jesus said, I must go um, to the cross. Peter said, not so, Lord. And Jesus had to say, I rebuke you, Satan. Because sometimes with zeal and not having knowledge, Right to apply proper wisdom, we would think that it is okay just because we have a promise to do evil. But that's not how God works. This is why David is a man after God's own heart. You can continue, Bishop. Amen. So he, verse 5, um, because he had uh, cut off it. Right, and it came to pass after all that David art smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, my master, the Lord's anointed. To hold on, forth hold my on, hold on, Bishop. Hold on one second here. The Lord forbid him that he, I should that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed. Didn't we just read in 1 Samuel chapter 2, 24, 
that the um sorry in first samuel chapter 14 rather that 16 verse 14 that the anointing of the lord departed from saul didn't we read that Yes. Then how is it that David is saying that this is the Lord's anointed? All right, continue, Bishop. So David, so David stayed his servant with these words and suffered them not to rise up against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went his way. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave. And cried after Saul, saying, My Lord the King. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men words saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen all that the Lord hath delivered thee today in mine hand in the cave. And he and some bade me kill thee, but mine eyes speared thee, and I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Amen. I want to know, I want to ask the question, how many of us would have seen our leader in this vulnerable state? and would have taken advantage of him. You know, Church of the Living God, I, I tell you the truth. Hear me as I tell you the truth. One of the hardest thing as a leader is for you to be vulnerable, right? One of the hardest thing as a leader is for us to be vulnerable. And individuals would want to let it seem as if we can't be vulnerable among our people or among those that we serve, right? But scripture showed us that God allows it so that we become vulnerable among those that we serve but the real submitted ones will cover their leader. They will cover their leader. We see this with Noah and his sons, right? One son saw his father's nakedness and started, because he was in a vulnerable state, started to mock him, laugh at him. The other two sons saw their father, which was their leader, he was the priest, okay, in a vulnerable state and gathered their blanket, grab a blanket and covered their father, which is symbolic of us as individuals that serve under a leader. Our duty is not to despise our leader in their weakness, but is to cover them in their weakness. Our duty is not to take a job after them in their weakness as we see. Saul was sleeping. In order for Saul to be sleeping, it meant that he was armorless. He had to take off his armor. He, he was vulnerable. He could have taken Saul out at any point. But what do you do when your leader is in a vulnerable state. And the naysayers behind is saying, kill him, kill him. He deserves it, expose him. Now, now am I saying that we are supposed to um, let, let leaders go unaccountable? Surely that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that God does not allow us to see the nakedness of our leaders so that we can have an opportunity to tear them down. 
We see something happen here with David. David heart smote him when he cut off a piece of Saul's garment. He cut off a piece of Saul's garment for a witness to Saul that he had the opportunity in which he could have killed him, but he chose not to. You see, we have to be careful with the spirit of blackmail. There are some individuals that are in the church that seek to blackmail the leader so that they can cut off a piece of their skirt when they're in or, or their gown or their cloth, when they're in their vulnerable state so that when the right time comes to lift up their hands against the leader, they have evidence. Do you know that there are people like that in the church? But here's the difference with the man, David. When he did that, his heart convicted him. David had a heart that was connected to God. And I pray that if there, even on this line, if there are any individual, whether you're in leadership or you're in the general audience, that have things that you consider to be blackmailing, to your leaders. I pray that our hearts will smote us and we will get rid of those things. Because when God exposes our leaders vulnerable, vulnerable state to us, it's not for us to make a mockery of it, but it's for us to cover the leader. We see this with Moses when he went up in the army. He brought Aaron and Ur with him. Here it is that Moses became weak. He was vulnerable now. And every time that his hands were up, Israel prevailed. When his hands became weak, Israel was losing the battle. There are times when God has positioned us, and I want to speak primarily now to leaders who serve under leaders. There are times when God has positioned us to be the ones who lift up the hands of the leader so that the general church can prevail, can win the battle. But we, if we are not careful, will take that opportunity as a means to say, you're an old man, go over there. We, we would find an opportunity to kick them out. You know how we do it in the 21st century. We vote them out, right? Because we say they're weak. They can't do it. They're not able to. But God has allowed us to see that so that we can lift up the leader's hand so that the general congregation can prevail. Because if you smite the leader, you smite the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. So we have to have a heart for the bigger picture and not just be drawn away according to our own lust and desire because we want the leadership. Another thing that we see here is that David called Saul Lord. The fact that he called him Lord, we see that again with Sarah, she called Abraham Lord. Not Lord capital L, but Lord common L, which is symbolic to the fact of them saying, I'm your, you are my leader. I'm submitted to you. I trust your instruction. Whatever you say to do, I will do. I want to know how many of us, I'm going to pick on the wise right now. How many of us will call our husbands Lord? Wives, let me pick on you for a second. I want to know how many of you um, is singing the song, I give myself away, I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. Yeah. 
you know, we're not going to find that in the 21st century. Lord, help if we find that. Because we have we've become so much so that our wives have been taught to empower themselves. And, and I don't have a problem with a woman empowering herself. But, you know, this, this feminist movement, right? Fem, feminist power, okay? Uh, that is that is surveilling or that is taking over the earth is now telling women that they don't really have to submit to man to men they don't have to be lesser than a man right and we can argue this left right the in between but the bottom line remains a woman that is married is submitted to her husband they are joined here to work together for the greater good, but they are not equal. They are not one and the same because the role that God has given to the man is different from the role that he has given to the woman. And anytime a wife usurps authority over the husband, Paul writes to Timothy and he says to Timothy, tell that woman to be silent. Tell her to be silent and let the husband teach his wife. You see what God did there? You see what Paul is saying there? Because God never, ever gives the wife the right to usurp authority over her husband. And husbands, if you, our wives are being disorderly in the house of God, God says that it's our duty to bring them home and teach them the right way. See, see we have husbands that we see our wives doing things that is not in the way that God ordains for it to be. And rather than correcting our wives and insisting that we go the right way, we leave them up to do what they want to do. So you see, when God comes now to judge the thing, he's not only judging the wife, he's going to also judge the husband, the leader. All right, my time is up. It's far spent. Uh, let me just run through this part real quick. When we look on um, the principle of lifting one's hand against the Lord's anointed, it extends beyond an anointed king of any of God's, to any of God's servants, rather, right? Uh, God warned King Abimelech not to arm Abraham, right? So anytime we are God's anointed, you cannot, you, we, you must not arm that individual, okay? He warns Laban not to arm Jacob. We see that. Even though, and watch this, uh, in, the, in, in these cases, Abimelech would be considered chief and Abraham considered the lower man. But Abraham, even though he's a lower man or a regular man in the eyes of the king, is still God's anointed. So you cannot harm him. You must not harm him. We see the same thing with Laban, right? Jacob is Laban's servant. And Jacob was fleeing for his life. He wanted to take his family and go back home. So he escaped by night. So when Laban, three days after, is going after Abraham, sorry, after Jacob, he's going after Jacob to kill him, to harm him. And God says, even though you're the leader, do not harm Jacob, right? The psalmist refers to these warnings. Mm -hmm. Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. And we see that in Psalms 105 and verse 50. So leaders, here it is. We are not 
to take advantage, disadvantage, or take advantage, however we say, of God's people. They are God's anointed. And so even though we are the under shepherd, we are the leaders given what we call ourselves the caretakers, we must never take the people of God for granted and treat them anyway. Because if we treat them anyway, God will judge us. Amen? All right, I'll wrap it up here for tonight. Are there any questions based on what was said tonight? I saw the chats going. Um, uh, um, Brother Mark, the teaching seems contrary to the New, New Testament because the Bible said in the New Testament and the Apostle Paul is saying that we should follow him as oh. we follow Christ. Yes. So um, if a leader is out of the way, mm -hmm. um, should we follow? <laughs> That's a good question. And I'm glad you brought that up, Bishop. <laughs> because in this case here, right? In this case here, in, and I, I'm so sorry we didn't get into our New Testament um, scriptures, right? But in this case here, when Paul is, is saying, follow me as I follow Christ, that is an, uh, in the sense that that was done, is an encouragement to come along with me because I am following after Christ. And if you follow after me, you will also learn Christ, right? Mm -hmm. We see this. We know this, that Paul was following after Christ because he said it in Philippians 3, right? Not that I have apprehended or in other words, I've attained, right? That for that which I have been apprehended for. He did not, he did not consider himself to have hit the mark but he continue to go after it. And so he's telling them, as I am going, come with me. Now, what if Paul had gone contrary to the will of God and had stepped away from the will of God? Then I'm not saying that if your leader is outrightly defiant or disobedient to the will of God, that we should um, step us, we should follow that leader. For example, if we know our leader is committing adultery, or we know our leader is um, embezzling, uh, doing some corruptible things, right? I'm not saying that we should condone the corruption that the leader is, 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 is following through with. But what I am saying is that it is not our place to lead a rebellion against the leader, an uprise, a takeover against the leader. That's not our place as the same, because that leader is still under or in that position because God has placed him there. And so when God sees it fit, God will remove that leader. Our duty is when we see the folly of the leader, one is to cover the leader in that we bring it to his awareness. We see that with Nathan dealing with King David. Okay, David had committed adultery, had killed the the wife of the husband of Bathsheba, 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 right, and had gotten her pregnant and was covering covering it up. Now nobody knew about it except God. Well, you want to just be honest here. I feel like the servants knew about it that was in the palace, of course, 
because he sent his servants to get her, right? But nobody came against King David. So he thought he had gotten away with it. But notice when Nathan the prophet came to David, he did not lift up his voice against David. He did not chastise David and said, you know, that you did this and you need to be taken down. And how dare you continue being the king? He did not do that. He came to David with a meek and quiet spirit. And he shared an, an analogy with David. And David's righteous indignation lifted up in him. And he said, who is the man? Because he was ready to go kill that man. And that's when Nathan said, thou art the man. Now, David could have said, how dare you uncover my skirt? But he didn't because David had a heart of God. He was a man after God's own heart. And this is where Psalm 51 was birthed. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. Because any leader that has a heart of God, that is a true leader and a shepherd, he's never going to be a perfect man or woman. But you know what? He will have a heart of God in which when he has met his folly, will go and say, have mercy upon me, O God. He won't be lifted up in his pride like uh, Nebuchadnezzar because then God will humble him. He will go down on his knees and repent and then also come and repent to those that he has wronged. And, and scripture shows us how we go about that, um, dealing with an offense and with leader to leader and stuff like that. So I hope I answered your question. I'm not telling people or the saints that you should continue with foolishness. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying if something has come to our attention, if something has been opened up to us, our duty is not to go and lead a rebellion against the leader, but is to go to the leader with a meek and quiet spirit and make our petition known. Just as how we, see, we saw David deal with Saul. Just as how we saw Samuel dealing with Eli. God expects us to do the same when we're dealing with our leaders, even when they are outside of the will of God. Because we're not perfect. And sometimes we fall outside of the will. Of God. All right. Um, I see a question here. How do you follow a leader or pastor who does not submit himself to his leadership? That's what we're dealing with tonight. I just gave you the, the answer. We are still, we still do the work. Maybe it wasn't clear enough. We are expected to still do the work still serve in the position, even though in our mindset, we think that the leader is outside of the will of God and is not submitting himself also to his leader because for him not to be submitting or her not to be submitting themselves to their leaders, it means that they're not submitted to God because true submission to God will say, Peter, lovest me more than these. Yea, Lord, you know that um, I love you. Well, Peter, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. So our duty is to serve that which belongs to God. The people in the congregation is not ours. They belong to God. So if we are submitted to God, we will be submitted to other leaders in the church and we will govern ourselves accordingly. Okay, go ahead, iPhone. I see your hands are raised. Bless the Lord. 
So I think I'm a little bit confused. Yes. So um, you mentioned if the leader mm -hmm. is out of the will of the Lord. Yes. We as the saint mm -hmm. would still follow the leader because we are being submissive. All right. So, so if, if the leader is of the will of the Lord, mm -hmm. what anointing is the leader operating under if they're out of the will of the Lord? Okay. So how do you know that they're out of the will of the Lord? Give me one scenario. How would you know that they are out of the will of the Lord? Um, if you have the spirit of discernment. Okay, so you have the spirit of discernment. What did you discern? Are you asking me that personally or? or yeah, just, just give me a scenario. Yeah, tell me something that you discerned. Not you personally, but yeah, it's, so you, you remember, you said that if you have the spirit of discernment, you will discern that the leader is out, okay, of the will of God. So what would you have discerned that would have said that they are out of the will of God? Give me a scenario. When they tell you to go kill the goat and drink it. All right. Good. Right? If they tell you to go kill the goat and drink it. Mm -hmm. Now, we know from Hebrews, reading from Hebrews chapter 6, um, even into Hebrews chapter 10, that the sacrifices of goats and of lamb is no longer needed because God has done the sacrifice once and for all. So we don't need now to go kill another goat or kill another um, lamb or dove to offer up sacrifice. So when the leader now is instructing us to do this, and that was what I was going to go into for the next slide, we were going to deal with civil disobedience. When is it right to disobey the leader. I can't touch it tonight. Yeah. I don't want to touch it tonight because we won't have time to deal with it. Because God does give us the basis on when we can say, mm -mm, that's not Bible. And then now start and, and, and has given us the right approach or way to deal with it, right? Whenever a leader is outside of scripture, then we get the rights to, as um, God's people, not to obey. We'll deal with that next week. I don't want to go into that. But what I um, this week, what I want us to deal with is the idea here, based on the scriptures that I brought up. It, if someone is saying that the leader is outside of the will of God because they have discerned it, that the leader is outside of the will of God. And what I'm talking about, it could be here that the leader, for example, with Eli, he did not correct his sons, right? When they were in the wrong. I've had, um, I, I went to Jamaica to preach recently. And when I went to one of the churches, an elder was speaking to me. And he said to me, that he went to correct uh, a sister for how uh, she was dressing. And that sister said to him, you can't correct me and your wife is just, is, is, um, is just in that way. Go correct your wife, okay? Now, the, the, the will of God is that the husbands are to teach their wives. The husbands are to help deal with their wives according to knowledge, okay? Now, if the leader is not talking to his wife, it doesn't mean that the leader cannot tell you the right thing because here it is. 
Samuel did not know the voice of God and it was Eli that told him what to do. So the leader, even though they are outside of the will of God, can still give instructions for us to do right. As long as it is not evil, we must still submit. We can't say because the leader has his wife dressing this way and he's going to talk to me about how I am dressing. That does not give us a right to defile or disobey the order of the leader because God still has that man or that woman in the position. And as long as God has that man or woman in the position, we are still expected to obey. We are still expected to um, follow through. I hear um, in my spirit, God dealing with um, uh, Abraham and told Ab instructed Abraham to cast out the bandwoman, woman, right? And so he cast out Agar, or Agar, right? Now, Agar is what you'd consider the servant. She's dealt with bitterly by the leader. She doesn't get up and, and, and lead a rebellion and say, well, I had your son, so I'm entitled to half of this property. I'm entitled to, no. She left because Abraham told her to leave. But you know what? God honored her obedience and met and sent an angel to meet her by the well and bestowed a blessing upon her. So that is what I'm saying, right? We might see the folly of a leader and think that justifies us to disrespect or disobey the leadership. And I'm saying to us tonight, it does not give us a right because if we raise our hand against the leader in his folly, we will be judged by God. The leader will be judged, but the leader must have a heart, like again, David, that will seek after God when he's in his folly and will desire to learn of God. I know this lesson is hard tonight and it's gonna take some time for us to get it, but we cannot, when our leaders are in their folly, use it as a means to disobey them and say, oh, God, um, is not with you because how can you be a man of God and you always shouting? How can you be a man of God and you, you have so much anger? People have said that. And because they have said that, they choose. Well, when he talks to me, I'm not going anywhere. He better not come to me and tell me to do this. Because I'm not doing nothing, right? We do have people in church that's like that because they have seen the folly of the leader. But I'm saying, when we see the folly of our leaders, it is not an occasion. It's not a right to lead a rebellion against the leader. Amen. Sister, um... Sister Stacy, did I answer your question? Um, yes, uh, Minister Ray. But um, so if you have a leader that speak like that, mm -hmm. uses anger in his voice or her voice, how do you get to that place where you can have that conversation with the leader mm -hmm. so you as the saint don't have to feel that way when the leader or leaders speak? That's that's a very good question, right? And in this case, I'll take you to Matthew chapter 18, okay? The Bible said, and I'll break down the scenario, but when you get a chance, read Matthew chapter 18. The Bible said that if there is um, one that is overtaken in a fault, 
right? You should go to that brother. And when you go to that brother or sister here, right? You should tell them what the folly is. Now, if they, if they're, if they can't reason, if you can't have an understanding, then you're supposed to take someone else with you, go and meet with that individual and discuss it, right? Now, um, that's when, and, and, and right here in this case, I'm not necessarily talking about your pastor. This is, this is an approach that the saint will do with the saint or, or if, it's, if it's a leader, like, you know, um, you can go to them with an individual. It's a principle, right? Uh, the, the other principle that I would use is uh, Luke chapter 17, I believe where if, if there is someone that has offended us, we that have been offended should go to that individual and the Bible says rebuke them, right? But the rebuke here is not to say, oh, the blood of Jesus is against you, you, you know, so and so and so and so. No, the rebuke here is in the Greek showing that individual what they said or what they did offended you and you're bringing it to their um, acknowledgement. Now, if that individual acknowledges that what you said to them was indeed hurtful to you and apologize, that individual is in the right. They are doing good. And that goes for leadership as well. They are doing good. But if they do not acknowledge the wrong that they have done uh, and add insult or pain to insult, right? God said it would have been better for that person to tie a millstone around their neck and be cast into the sea than to offend uh, his children. So what I'm saying, Sister Stacy, is that we just need to go to that person with a spirit of meekness, which means gentleness, and bring it to their awareness. Because sometimes they just don't know that how they said a thing was offensive. Sometimes they really just don't know. And so you just bring it to their attention. You just go to them and you say, my brother, uh, my sister, you know, pastor, uh, you, you, you know, I did not really appreciate how you said that word today. It came across a little offensive, right? And allow for pastor now to acknowledge it and say, you know, my sister, my brother, I really did not notice that it was coming off that strong. Okay, I, I will adjust how I say this goes going forward. It's not that what the pastor said was wrong, right? It, it, it's like, um, there's a way you can ask somebody to take up the phone off the table. And then there's a way that you can ask somebody to take the phone off the table. And so depending on how you ask that individual or how you come to that individual, you um, might bring across offense or um, not. I'm going to use Sister Kayan for, for an example. I think this is an, a very nice one I can use to close off this. And I'm sure Sister Kayan wouldn't mind. So on, on, um, on church, at our church, you all know, we are, we, we are streaming on a Sunday. Uh, the, uh, the live stream is going, the, the lyrics are up, the words are up. Um, it's just full blown operation, right? Uh, Sister Kayan was in the sound room and how I am, for those who know me from Jamaica, know me here, when it comes on to the, the, the ministry part, I'm very passionate with the music. I'm, I'm going, I'm just clicking, I'm just moving, I'm very passionate. And sometimes that passion can come across offensive to others, right? Which was the case in, in this scenario where the lyrics wasn't coming up 
and you know we're running the set and we're not seeing the lyrics and i get off the keyboard and i'm moving fast and i jump in the song and i'm sister Kane, why is that why is the lyric not up <laughs> His sister Kay looked at me and was like, Brother Ray? Uh-uh. You know, and I'm saying, the lyrics need to be up now. Now, to me, I'm like, it's game time. Let's get what needs to be done going. Okay. And we can talk about everything else afterwards. But the approach was not good, even though. It wasn't bad to ask about what's going on with the production. The approach wasn't good, right? Later that afternoon, um, after every after the dust was settled, Sister Kayon um, called me, and she said, "Brother, I did not appreciate how you spoke to me today, and stuff like that." And uh, we had a long discussion. And she, she now understood that I was not doing that to in any way offend her. I was just looking on the bigger picture, which we all do have a blind spot of, I wanted to get the thing so that everything is perfect. And brothers and sisters, today, when I go into the sound room, Sister Kayan does not, uh, take offense to when I ask questions or when I'm moving fast. She now has an understanding that really Brother Ray doesn't mean any harm. He's just trying to make sure that things are flowing um, so that we can do things in the spirit of excellence. So I, I hope I'm, I'm clearing this up for you, Sister Stacy, in that, uh, you know, sometimes, and again, in this situation, I would have been and was outside of the will of God, because the will of God is that I approach my brothers and sisters in the spirit of meekness and gentleness, okay? So even for me, that was a learning curve, and I had to now watch how I say things, how I do things when I'm in the heat of the moment, because sometimes it can come across offensive, and it doesn't necessarily mean that I was wrong. It just means that I didn't take the right approach, right? Which might give me a ding where I fall out of the will of God because God expects of us to be perfect, to be mature, and to do things with a spirit of excellence. All right? Praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, my time is far spent. I will not. Blessing, Minister Ray, before your time for spend, blessings. You said, um, Sister Kian, you weren't wrong, but I, you did not take the right approach. So I wasn't if wrong you, in terms of. But you did not take the, the right approach. If you did not take the right approach, it's wrong. No, listen to what I'm saying. I was not wrong in wanting to have the, um, the production going with the spirit of excellence, right? It's not wrong. I'm not wrong to have that desire, wanting things to be perfect where ministry and worship is concerned. And so I'm passionate about that. But my approach in wanting something to be perfect was wrong. So that's what I'm saying. It's not necessarily that I have a wrong desire, but if the approach is wrong, it can um, taint things and make things a whole lot worse. And so as leaders, we have to be careful. We have to be mindful of how we do things um, and make sure that we're in the will of God. But if it's that, we are outside of the will of God. Our, those who we serve or those who serve under us should not use it as, as an occasion to raise a hand against the leader. Sister Kayan could have done that, but she did not do that. She waited until 
the dust cleared. And then she called me and, 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 and revised the, the situation. And we were able to render apologies. I did render apology for the offense that I caused. And, you know, even, even me and you, sister, uh, Rosetta. <laughs> don't go there. Don't go there. I've, I've had. Let that by go. Let that by go. <laughs> but no, I'm just saying for the purpose of the lesson. But when we, when we have offended each other, right, our duty is to bring it to the awareness of the individual because they really might not know. And in, in this case, as leaders, we might not know. But it's not a right for those who we serve or those who serve under us to lift up their hands against us. The duty or the responsibility, the expectation that God has for us is that we continue to be faithful and serve in our positions. That's what. So, Minister Ray, what if you offended me and say something that I feel offended about it? And I come to you and I said, Pastor Ray, you know, you said something and it really offend me. And you think that, oh, you're above my level, so I shouldn't come to you. And then you you went to your wife and, you know, you said the one sister Rosetta, she come and tell me that I am, she didn't like what I said. And, you know, you don't acknowledge that it offended me. Mm -hmm. How do I deal with that? Okay. So again, if, if we, if, if ever we are really, because we're talking about maturing right if ever we are really submitted to god that approach or that mindset will throw it through the door okay anybody that comes to us as leaders let me say this leaders anyone that comes to us with a right justification or with a concern it is our duty to listen to that individual and to acknowledge that we have hurt them. And in acknowledging it, we now try to make amends. We must never think that we are too high, um, that we can't um, hear what someone is saying. And Sister Rosetta, if we don't hear, then you go and you pray about it and you turn it over to the Lord. And God will deal with it. Believe me when I tell you, God will judge us as leaders if we mishandle his anointed ones. Amen. God bless you all. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for sticking out this um, lesson with us. Again, I know it, it, it's a tough one, but please bear with me as we get through this one. Amen. I now turn back over to our bishop.